As uh, Secretary of State, you led the international community to a successful treaty with Iran, preventing them from building a nuclear bomb. The Trump administration has pulled out of that deal. What are the d dynamics now playing out with regards to Iran? What worries you? And what are your hopes? Mm -hmm. Well, it's a very good question. <clears throat> I'm going to take a minute here, folks, because this is, this is super important stuff. Um, I am a passionate supporter of Israel, have been all my life. Uh, I had 28 years as a United States senator, 28 years plus, with a 100% voting record on behalf of Israeli interests. As Secretary of State, I intervened countless times to protect Israel from being the butt of a Human Rights Council uh, committee, uh, you know, resolution or a UN General Assembly resolution or a ICC, International Criminal Court, et cetera. So I take a second seat, nor does President Obama. We, we both would take a second seat to nobody. We did a $38 billion, 10-year, long-term security program with Israel. I mean, we, we uh, were there. But here's the deal, folks. For, for every administration since 1948, Republican and Democrat, we, the United States, have been opposed to settlements. And unfortunately, settlements were continuing. And they continued notwithstanding our constantly saying to the government in Israel, you've got to stop this. This is not appropriate. You're going to destroy the opportunity for a two-state solution. And the answer would be, well, that's not really the problem in not getting a two-state solution. It's other things. Well, it's a pretty significant problem when the land disappears. And we've gone from Oslo Accords to from 90, uh, from uh, about 100,000 settlers. Now there are more than 500,000. So it's a bigger problem. How do you move people? What becomes part of Israel? How do you settle the issue? I say all of this as a prelude to simply saying that Israel, Prime Minister Netanyahu, was vehemently opposed to dealing with Iran. He thought we ought to bomb Iran. And he asked Obama for permission to bomb Iran. The king of Saudi Arabia, King Abdullah, told me face to face, the only way to deal with Iran is bomb them. And President Mubarak said the same thing to me, you got to bomb them. Uh, he went a little further. He, he said, you got to bomb them. And I said, well, Mr. President, I have, I'm absolutely convinced that if we were to bomb them, you'd be the first guy out in the street the next day criticizing us for bombing in our country over here. And he'd say, yes, I would. Of course I have to do that. <laughs> ha, ha, ha. And I said, yeah. Uh, so anyway, bottom line, folks, uh, one of my lessons learned in Vietnam is before you ask young men and women to get dragged into a war, to be in a war, you owe it to our nation and to them and their families to make absolutely sure you have exhausted all the possibilities of diplomacy. So that is what, <clears throat> that is what we set out to do. Now, on the day in September of 2013, when I sat down with the Foreign Minister of Iran for the first meeting between the Secretary of State and the Foreign Minister of Iran in almost 40 years, on that day, Iran had 12,000 kilograms of enriched uranium. They were two or months or so away from commissioning a plutonium reactor that would have produced weapons-grade plutonium, enough for two bombs a year. They had 27,000 centrifuges that were deployed. It's 19,000 spinning, enriching uranium. They were two months away, according to our intelligence community, from an ability to break out and make a bomb. And so we decided consciously, we object to what Iran is doing with Hezbollah. We object to what Iran is doing in Syria. We object to what Iran is doing transferring weapons to Yemen. We object to Iran's threats to Israel. We object to Iran meddling in Iraq. Those are a bunch of objections, but guess what? We decided we will be in a much better place to leverage Iran to different behavior on all of those things if we can prevent them from getting a nuclear weapon. And if you take the nuclear weapon off the table, you have a whole lot more leverage besides who were our partners in taking the nuclear weapon off the table. 
China, Russia, France, Germany, and Britain. So we had the UN Security Council, 15 to nothing, endorsing this approach, which, by the way, contrary to what the president says, because he says it's the worst deal ever, saying so by him does not make it the worst deal ever. <laughs> this deal, this deal is in fact, and I'm not kidding you, this deal is the strongest, most transparent, most exhaustive nuclear deal on the planet today. And I'll tell you what we achieved. We took the 12,000 kilograms down to 300 kilograms for 15 years, the next 15 years. You cannot physically build a bomb with only 300 kilograms. We took their enrichment down to 3.67%. You have to enrich at 80 to 90% to make a bomb. You can't do a bomb at 3.67%. And we check it every single day. We know what they're doing. We put an additional 130 inspectors into Iran. We took their 27,000 centrifuges. They've been reduced to about 5,000 of the oldest type they had, and they're limited in the amount they can enrich. Their stockpile can't go over the 300 kilograms. We have cradle-to-grave tracing of every ounce of uranium they mine and then mill, make yellow cake, put in a, a centrifuge, and take out as waste. And we have every accounting for what kind of uranium they have in the process. They are not allowed to do anything different than that for the 15 years. For 20 years, <coughs> we have television cameras looking at their centrifuge production. For 25 years, we have the tracing of the uranium. But here's the most important thing. There's a lifetime set of requirements under the nonproliferation treaty that they signed up to. Everything I just said is extra. They are still held to the nonproliferation treaty. And by the way, unlike most countries, we made Iran accept what's called the additional protocol, which was put in place because of the failure during the Clinton years by the, when North Korea cheated. And when North Korea cheated, they came up with a whole new way to make sure people can't cheat, called the additional protocol. Iran has agreed to live by the additional protocol. And guess what, folks? Under the additional protocol, we have a right, if there's any building where we suspect something may be happening, we have a right to demand inspection. Now, guess what? The Prime Minister of Israel just the other day said he thinks there's some building in Tehran that's being used. Well, we've lost the right to demand that they do it now because we pulled out. But France or Germany or Britain could ask for permission to it because guess what? During this last week in New York, when the world laughed at the President of the United States when he claimed something in the General Assembly, the, 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 the Russians, Chinese, Germans, French, and British, and Iranians met together to determine how they can keep the Iran nuclear agreement alive. So I got news for you. I, I, I'll tell you something. Here's what's happened. The president pulls out. And he's now pursuing a, basically a regime change policy, which is to put so much economic pressure on Iran that allegedly they're going to collapse and they'll come up with a, a, a new leader or a new regime. But I got news for you. I, maybe five years from now, two years from now, I'll be proven wrong, but most experts who've studied Iran, who've dealt with Iran, know this. Iran, as I said earlier, is a 5,000-year-old culture, history. What's happened now, because of the attack that took place in Iran the other day, nationalism is rising in Iran. And what pulling out has done is affirm every single one of the doubts that Ayatollah Khamenei had about negotiating with the United States. And the result is that politically, the hardliners in Iran have actually been strengthened because Donald Trump proved true all of their warnings that you cannot negotiate with the United States. And therefore, I got news for you folks. If there's a collapse in Iran, I'm not going to say there might not be, you are not going to see some Jeffersonian Democrat emerge. <laughs> You're going to see another Ahmadinejad or a hardliner emerge because they're the ones who have the guns, they're the ones who have the strength, they have the ability to do it. So <laughs> we had Iran in a place where it was reaching out. It was changing. 
It wanted to do business with the world. It wanted to behave differently. And by the way, I believe there's a negotiation that has never been held that could deal with these other problems. Because why do I say that? Because we were about to deal with them when the administration ended. We kept sanctions in place on missiles. We kept sanctions in place against Iran on their human rights abuses. We kept sanctions in place on their transfer of weapons to Yemen. We kept sanctions in place for their support of Hezbollah. And we raised those sanctions, folks. So I believe, in, in effect, bottom line, I know it's a long answer, but I want to put the facts out, because not enough people are dealing with facts in America today. They're just not dealing with facts. You know, Senator Moynihan of New York had a great saying that, that everybody's entitled to their own opinion, but you're not entitled to your own facts. Now, we're living in a world of alternative facts. You know InfoWars the other day? Anybody know InfoWars? InfoWars is a site, puts out news. The other day, InfoWars put out that Hurricane Lane that was barreling down on Hawaii, remember the hurricane just a few weeks ago? That Hurricane Lane was split in two by an energy beam that was fired from Antarctica by me, by John Kerry. <laughs> I mean, talk about facts, lack of facts. How could they screw it up? I fired it from the North Pole. <laughs> But, but I mean, seriously, we, how do we deal? How do you deal? We have people who say climate change isn't happening. Houston, you had a one in 50,000 year storm. You had five days of rain. You had as much rain here in five days as flows over Niagara Falls in an entire year. And that's, that's happening now in many places frequently. Why? Because of the warming of the ocean. The warming of the ocean produces more moisture in the air. It fills the intensity of storms. It creates more flooding. And, and one of the reasons we have greater fires in California and elsewhere is because the flooding creates rapid growth of, of brush and fauna where it wouldn't grow before, so there's more to burn. So you get an unholy, unvirtuous cycle going on here, folks. And, I, you know, I've, I've worked on this issue for 30 years. Just two days ago, there was a report that the Trump administration has a report now that came out from the EPA or somewhere acknowledging that the warming of the Earth is going to take place up to 4 degrees centigrade, 7 degrees Fahrenheit in this century. But you know what the Trump re response to that is? Oh, it's going to happen anyway. So we can lift the tailpipe restrictions. We don't need to worry about emissions on tailpipes, because it's going to happen anyway. Folks, it doesn't have to happen anyway. It's the course we are on track to meet. But if we do, and I negotiated the Paris Agreement, if we do what we set out to do with Paris and more, we have the solution to the crisis of climate change. You know what it is? Energy policy. Energy policy. If we produce our electricity, drive our cars, produce things in a way that reigns in the level of emissions, we can still prevent the worst damage of climate change. And I want you all to go Google this. Just go Google the report. And when you read the report, you will see where we're heading unless we do the things that we could do. And you'll see what it says, how catastrophic it is. We'll have refugees in the world in places we don't have them today. We'll lose rivers and water in places we do have it today. We'll have food production crises. I mean, it is catastrophic. This is, this is truly life and death. I'm, just, I'm, not, I'm not trying to hype it. It is. And it's why I've spent the time on it. Uh, and, and so... Do you have some, some <laughs> hopes after the Trump administration pulling out of Paris Climate Accords? I do, and I'm glad you asked that. That's Randall, thank you for getting me on an important point here, folks. This is why another reason, this is actually another reason why I'm really optimistic, folks. Donald Trump pulls out of the Paris Agreement. You can't officially be legally out of the agreement until one day after the 2020 election. Is that motivation or not? <laughs> but, but leaving that aside, leaving that aside, the day he announced this, 
I was on the phone with governors. Governors were on the phone with each other. I was on the phone with mayors and people. We were all sort of humming, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Guess what? 38 states in the United States of America have already passed renewable portfolio laws requiring them to move towards alternative renewable sustainable energy. And those 38 states represent 80% of the population of the United States of America. So, mayors, more than 1,000 mayors have come together. The mayor of every major city in our country, including here, all the major city mayors have agreed that they're going to continue to try to do what's necessary to avoid the worst consequences. So they're going to do recycling. They'll do building codes. They'll do transportation initiatives. Uh, they'll require certain um, standards for fleet purchase of automobiles for the city. or other. I mean, there are a whole bunch of things you can do. And here's the result. The result is that Donald Trump may have pulled out of the Paris Agreement, but what I'm able to say to people around the world, the American people are still in it and still committed to try to meet this agreement. So uh, why be hopeful? Be hopeful because, because those are two big things that Donald Trump says I'm not going to be part of, America's getting out of, but guess what? They're still going on. They're still going on. The leader of China, the leader of Russia, the leader of France, Germany, Britain are all saying we're committed to continue to fight this. So that's why the clock ticking is so key. And I, you know, I'll just be very blunt with everybody here. In 40 days or whatever it is, uh, between now and the midterm elections, we have the greatest opportunity possible for a major mid-course correction in the direction we're going. And that's what we have to do. We have time for one more question. What drove you to write this book? What drove me to write this book is very straightforward, and I, I write about it in the book in, in, in the author's note, which is one paragraph, where I explain the meaning of every day is extra, uh, which very simply is the lessons learned in a war when you're lucky enough to come back are live a life of purpose, every day is extra. You are lucky. A lot of guys weren't, mostly guys back then, not exclusively. Nurses also died in Vietnam. Uh, but we, I think everybody has that. Uh, it ought to be a life thing. But anybody who's had cancer, anybody who's had a near brush with death, anybody who's had a car accident, I mean, you know, there are lots of ways in life. You don't have to be a veteran to have a feeling that every day is extra. And I wrote the book to make sure people understand that. I wrote the book because at this moment in American history, it's up to you, it's up to Americans, it's up to citizens to be citizens. And I wanted to show in this book the journey of difficulties that we've been through. I wanted to show people how, in effect, you know, Woodward's book is a great book, important book, it, it articulates the problem. My book, I believe, is the roadmap for how you make the Senate work. How you get John McCain, John Kerry, but everybody to be doing that. How you actually hold government accountable. How you stand up against powerful interests. How you fight back. For 18 years, I know Beto was not taking PAC money. For 18 years, I never took a dime of PAC money running for the United States Senate. And uh, I, I think, you know, you need people who are going to stand up and, and be principled about things and fight to restore our democracy. I think this book lays it out. And why am I optimistic we can do it? Go back to the 1960s, folks. When I was a freshman in college, we almost went to war over Cuba with, with the Soviet Union. When I was a sophomore, I was sitting, you know, I'd, I'd been substituted in the Harvard Yale soccer game. I was sitting on the bench, catching my breath, and I heard a ripple go through the crowd. The president's been shot. And before too long, that turned out to be the president is dead. I did not even remember who won that game or if we finished the game until I researched this book. Mm -hmm. I went back to the, to the newspaper and found out, oh, we lost three to two and whatever. I didn't, you know, it was so gripping for us what happened. The next year, dogs were attacking human beings. 
at the Edmund Pettus Bridge, and we were fighting for civil rights, and I traveled to the South and saw signs that said, no colored, white only, and things said, wait a minute, this is the United States of America, how can this be? And then, senior year, Vietnam. Lyndon Johnson says, I need 500,000 troops, uh, you know, and, and we all had our lives changed. That was just up to 1962. I mean, 1962 to 66. In 68, Medgar Evers was assassinated. Martin Luther King assassinated. Robert Kennedy assassinated. We had pipe bombs in certain cities in America. We had people with machine guns raiding homes and kidnapping people. We had uh, a president who had an enemies list, who fired the special prosecutor, who attacked the Justice Department, who didn't tell the truth, who turned out to be a crook. And the whole country was reeling from the uncertainties about where we were going and the whole cultural revolution that took place at that point in time. Colleges and universities that didn't hold exams, that, that stopped in, in, in essence. Think about it, folks. Well, we get through that, and we're stronger because we got through it. We've done pretty well. I mean, we've done amazingly well as a nation. The world is, in fact, despite all the challenges, 300 million kids who aren't going to go to school, 2.2 2, 2 billion children, 15 to 24, who don't have jobs and don't have an opportunity for the future, 1.8 billion children, 15 years old or younger, who are in need of education and a future and opportunity, which is why we can't withdraw from the world. Because 95% of the customers of the world live in other countries. You can't just sell to yourself and pretend you're going to be a stronger nation. So the fact is, we're actually capable, because we've shown how we're capable, of solving every single problem we face. We really are. We've discovered new energy, solar, wind, hydro. Uh, who knows whether we'll break through on fusion. We're going to get better battery storage. We're making extraordinary progress. We are curing diseases we never thought we'd cure. Smallpox, polio, TB. Uh, we have individualized cancer treatments today because of the genome. We live longer. We live better. We actually have more people having more income, better than ever before in human history. 400 million People came out of poverty in China, 400 million in India, new middle class. We have taken the global severe poverty level from 50% when I was in school to less than 10% today, folks. We're making amazing progress. I mentioned to you the brink of kids without AIDS in Africa, the stopping Ebola. We can solve these problems, and President Kennedy reminded us that every problem we know on the planet, other than some God-given or whatever given natural disaster, every other problem is human caused. You know what? I have never met a child, and I don't think you have either, two and a half years old, who hates anybody. They may hate their broccoli. They may hate getting orders from mom or dad or something, but guess what? They don't hate other human beings. Hate is taught. Everything we face as a challenge today, the tribalism, the thing, you know, even the, the, the violence. You know, as abhorrent as seeing somebody in a jumpsuit in the middle of the desert have their head cut off is, and it's the worst thing I've ever seen, coupled with that Jordanian pilot burning in a cage uh, at the hands of ISIS. We've seen some horrible things. And the reason they do it is to scare you and make you feel intimidated and exactly for the horrific reaction you get. But you know what, behind that? Behind that, far fewer people are dying anywhere in the world in the dawning of the 21st century than died in the 20th century. And you think about 30 million Russians alone fighting back against Hitler and fascism, 6 million Jews in the Holocaust. How many, I mean, run the list of the millions of civilians and World War I, and Korea, and, and, and what was happening with terror. So I'm just saying to you folks, I really am optimistic, and you should be too, providing you are prepared to go out and involve yourselves 
and building community. You don't have to do it federally. But we have to hold our public people accountable to a higher standard, and we have to put real choices in front of people to start to fix the country. I mean, just take something as simple and prosaic as infrastructure. The Chinese are spending $1 trillion a year now on the One Belt, One Road project that touches 70 countries, and they're building infrastructure all throughout those countries. They have built railroads that go from China to Europe, 49 different routes, touches seven European countries. It is now cheaper to take goods from China to Europe by rail than by ship or by air. They're building ports in Djibouti, in Sri Lanka, in Myanmar, and three other countries. I forget which ones they are. But they're building ports around the India. What are we doing? What are we doing? You know, I, I live on the East Coast. You guys are here in the you know, central west of the country. But we've got that regional Amtrak train. It goes, it can go 150 miles an hour, but you know how much it goes 150 miles an hour between Washington and New York? 18 miles. Why? Because it can't go fast under the Baltimore Tunnel because it'll cave in. It can't go fast over those rickety old bridges from the cow paths over the Chesapeake because it'll wind up in the Chesapeake. I, I rode on a train in, in China from Beijing to the coast, and an attendant put a glass on my table, and the glass didn't move more than this one is right now. We were going 300 miles an hour from their half hour from the coastline. Uh, folks, I, I love our country, and I want our country to be first in everything we can be first in, but I got to tell you, if we don't start rebuilding America and dealing with our traffic jams that everybody spends unbelievable productive hours sitting in, wasting gasoline and not, you know, always working, we're, we're losing out. And we're the country that went to the moon. We're the country that invented the internet. And God knows, I mean, how many other things can you think of? We've got to get about real choices. I don't see those real choices being made in Washington, frankly, right now. But I pray they will be. Um, and I hope every single one of you will feel, if you get involved, you can make the difference. And how do I say that? Because it was young people in 1970 that made the difference, 1969. The peanut butter and jelly brigades that went up to New Hampshire, that empowered Linda, uh, uh, Gene McCarthy to send a message to Lyndon Johnson, you can't run for president anymore. That was young people. The civil rights movement was young people. The women's movement was young people, by and large. And the environment efforts. And when I came back from Vietnam, the first thing I did was become involved with Earth Day. And guess what we did? We brought 20 million Americans out of their homes on Earth Day of 1970, but then we translated it into a political movement where people voted what mattered, their issues. We targeted the 12 worst votes in the United States Congress, and in the next election, seven of the 12 lost their seats. You know what the message from that is? For the colleagues who survive, that seeing their friends lose is the greatest spine strengthener, <laughs> compass focus there is. And as a result of that, we passed the Clean Air Act, safe drinking water, marine mammal protection, coastal zone management, and the EPA was created. The United States didn't even have an EPA until that took place. So. Um, I'm confident about the future because I know what we've done in the past. I know what you've done when we try to make a difference. And I'm absolutely confident if we go out and do this hard work yet again, we can reclaim our own democracy and we can reclaim the future, not just of our country, but the position of leadership of the United States of America as the leader of the free world and the country that is indispensable to making some of these things happen on a global basis. Privileged to be with you. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a gift. It's been a beautiful audience. Thank you. I can tell you're wrapped. We had a very important conversation. We'll see you at the book signing. Secretary Kerry, we like to give clocks because we like to say it's our time. Very pretty.
It's engraved, John Kerry, Progressive Forum, and the date. Congratulations. Thank, Thank you, you so for much, a very everybody. important Thank evening. You. Thanks very much. Well done.